With me today is a, a member of our Council of Scholars at Compact for America, Ilya Shapiro, constitutional scholar at Cato Institute. Uh, Ilya, thanks for being on. Sure. Always good to be involved with both Compact and IHS. Well, uh, you know, one of the great things about you is you've been involved both uh, intimately and on the periphery of the Article 5 movement now for quite some time. Uh, you're familiar with a lot of the big issues, and one of the issues that you often hear in amending the Constitution is that uh, that you don't want to have too much policy in a, in a constitutional amendment. I, to be blunt, I don't really know what that means, but but maybe you have some thoughts on that. I, you know, where do you draw the line between the sorts of political changes that you want to do by statute and the sorts of political sta uh, changes that you would want to do by a constitutional amendment? Well, look, uh, the Constitution is the people's document. It's the way to create a government to secure and protect their liberties. And so whatever the people in their in their wisdom want to put in that is uh, I don't have much of a problem with. I mean, if, if the people decide, you know, uh, three quarters of state legislatures decide that uh, there should be a flat tax at 17 uh, percent and that should be constitutionalized. Um, not necessarily anything wrong with that. So I don't have kind of a broad principled perspective, yay or nay, you should or shouldn't constitutionalize certain things. In general, with the amendment process, I mean, I've always said that um, the only real amendment we need is uh, after every line in the Constitution to add, and we mean it. And that would just take care of uh, all the mischief that the Supreme Court has caused over the last 70 years. But look, um, what we're talking about here with debt and, and balanced budgets um, this this amendment, uh, the, the 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 compact, uh, well, the compact is the is the mechanism, but the amendment that's being proposed um, doesn't set uh, any particular level of spending or taxation or priorities over uh, you know what kind of federal program should exist. All it says is that the budget should be balanced. So whatever concerns you might have about a constitution somehow unduly tying the hands. Uh, of Congress or of the federal government, I, I really don't think is a concern here. Well, why wouldn't you just want to rely on you know the ordinary political process to? Because it hasn't worked. Uh, well, why wouldn't uh, politicians just see the the the, pl the the fiscal problems coming and, and and choose to you know by statute or appropriations limit themselves? Well, why, why do they have to change the fundamental law to to limit their what they borrow? Well, sometimes you have to uh, tie yourself to the mast, as it were, to make uh, an analogy to, to Greek mythology. Uh, and uh, what the reason why I like the compact is it's it's elegant and it's efficient in the sense that you have this turnkey operation, this one-stop shop, if you will. Once a state votes to approve. Uh, to join the compact, uh, which calls for a convention to approve a certain type of balanced budget amendment, that's it. You have uh, the action of, of just those number of uh, three quarters of the states and then one congressional action. That's a lot simpler than having to go back and forth and negotiate among the states, um, hopefully have them call for the similar type of convention from Congress, have Congress approve the comp or have Congress approve the uh, call the uh, convention and then send it to ratification. Um, you know that uh, uh, it just takes more steps. Now I should say that uh, never in our history have we amended our constitution in this way. I'm not just saying through a compact. I mean through a convention of the states. That's not uh, to say that it's a bad idea or harder than a different way of amending the constitution. Indeed, a certain number of times there were enough convention calls from the states and. Congress saw the writing on the wall and decided to get ahead of that movement and call its own convention. There's no guarantee that that wouldn't happen in this situation. If Compact for America keeps getting states more and more every year uh, and they hit some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, critical points, uh, Congress might say, oh, look, this really is, uh, you know, we want to be able to, to shape this more and then take it uh, not so much uh, uh, make it be state driven, but let's let's us uh, let, let's we take credit for this, and and they would uh, call the convention that way, and that's perfectly fine as as far as I'm concerned. At the end of the day, I'm more vested in having uh, better structural reform than um, you know having this me one mechanism or another being responsible for the ultimate amendment. Do you think Washington, without pressure from the states? would ever propose with two-thirds of each House of Congress a balanced budget amendment with any teeth? I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, there have been balanced budget amendments that have come close uh, in the last 25 years. 
Um, but uh, there's always some uh, some uh, roadblock, some passable roadblock. And I think in this, among other areas, uh, we've seen in the last couple of presidential administrations that there really is a lot, uh, there's a vacuum that the federal government has filled and states need to push back on that federal power in this, among other ways. Now, I'm not talking about nullification or ignoring federal law or anything like that, but just using the tools that the Constitution provides to the states uh, to push back against some of the, the excesses that have been coming, both from Congress legislatively and also through the administrative state in terms of uh, executive actions. If we don't limit the borrowing capacity of the federal government, what defense constitutionally do our kids and their kids have when it comes to paying down that debt that they never chose to incur? Well, I mean, you can default. We've seen various countries around the world. Uh, you see what happens when uh, you get to the brink uh, with Greece, which is a story that I don't think is by any means over. Um, uh, of course, if you default, then uh, that um, – uh, well, there are a lot of uh, bad economic and political uh, consequences at, at that point. You can uh, devalue the currency. You know, the, the Fed can uh, print lots and lots of dollars leading to hyperinflation. That, that'll that get rid of your debt, but it'll also throw your people into poverty. We've seen various countries go through that. Um, you know, there, there are no real good solutions. Um, you know, people propose the... Uh, uh, you know, just keep raising the debt ceiling. I mean, at the end of the day, if China or whoever keeps wanting to lend us money, regardless of our ability to repay, that's uh, on them uh, almost as much as it is on us. But I think the, the game of musical chairs is going to be up uh, at some point. It's, it's simply unsustainable to increase your debt to GDP ratio uh, beyond a certain point. And I think to get a handle on this, and as we just discussed, Congress isn't going to do it by itself. We do need state action.